On November 7th, 1847, a boy was born and he was named William Thompson. It was 40 years later, in 1887, when he penned the song, There's a Great Day Coming. We've been spending some time in the month of January talking about the beginnings of things and how things begin, the beginning of the world, the beginning of years. And I want us to spend some time this morning talking about the Judgment Day because everything that begins has an end. Everything that begins has an end. The lives in which we live, they had a beginning date. For William Thompson, it was November 7th, 1847. For many of us, it was not that far ago. We have a beginning and we have an end. We understand as we look through Scripture that man was created by God. And at some point in time, unknown to mankind, only known to God, all of God's creation in the humanity of man and woman, will be gathered together in a day that's called the Judgment Day. And thus we see the beginning of all ends. It's the beginning of the end of the time of which exists on the earth. When we think about this song that's a great day coming, we can think about the man in which wrote the song, and we can think of the other songs in which he would sing or write, Softly and Tenderly Jesus is Calling, Lead Me Gently Home, Father, Jesus is all the world to me. When we think about November the 7th, 1847, we do not usually think there will be an end. When we think to the day in which the song was written, there's a great day coming, in 1887, we do not usually think there will be an end. But as the song depicts, There is a great day coming. It may be today. It might be tomorrow. And it could be a thousand years from now. We do not know. You know, many great days come to our mind when we're thinking about great days, especially our theme for the month, beginnings. We think about the beginning of the world and what a great day that would have been. The seven days in which existed when the earth was first formed and how glorious and magnificent they would have been. But in those days... There will be a day in which there will be an end. We think along the pages of history, at least biblical history, we think about how Noah, his beginning was a great day. He built an ark and it was a great day. There was a flood. It was a tragic day. And there was a day in which the earth was seen again. And it was a great day. But in all of that, there was going to be an end. We think about how Abraham ascended the mount to go offer Isaac. We think about how Moses and Israel, they triumphantly marched out of the land of Egypt. We think about how God gave Moses his words. We think about how Joshua led the people of God all across the land into a land in which was promised. We think about the cross of Calvary and the day in which was filled with greatness a day in which the Son of God was offered. We think about some time later, just a very short few days, and we think of the day in which He rose from the tomb. And we know what a great day that was. We think about the day the Lord's church was established, and we understand what a blessing it was. All of these days are pointing to something else. And we could spend time with each one of us in this room and we could talk about the day in which we were born. I could tell you the day a little boy was born. 
And you could probably tell me of the days your children were born. And you could probably, and already in your mind, you can remember the great day that was. But you know, there's a day that surpasses all days. And it's the day in which it's described as the day of judgment. We're going to follow three short little points this morning to direct our thoughts in this day. The first is going to be it's a day of greatness. When we think about the day of judgment, the judgment day, we should always think about it as a day of greatness. Great things will happen on this day. Number two, we need to think about how it's a day of brightness. It's a day of brightness. And we're going to talk about a value for brightness. And we're going to talk about 100 watt light bulbs and try to figure out how bright this day is. And we're going to come up with a number. But we're also going to talk about another term which may be a bit confusing. A day of sadness. I've always professed and will always profess there will be no sadness for the child of God on the judgment day. But we must remember there will be sadness. But we need to understand for the child of God, sadness does not exist on the day of judgment. We just need to see what place sadness has with this day. So let's begin with our very first idea, a day of greatness. When you imagine the judgment day, there are many things in which escape upon your minds. The first thing I want you to imagine is the number of souls that will be there. We understand that in this room are approximately 220 people. And we understand that number quite easily because we see this number before. We know as we go throughout places in life, there are greater numbers that exist. We can imagine things like concerts, uh, shopping malls which are filled with people, and we can see the great number of people that exist. We can see the souls that exist. We can see all of these numbers of people. I, I like to go people watching. I tell Kelly all the time, people watching. Because in the midst of all of the people, there's going to be a great crowd at the Day of Judgment. And I like to watch people. When you think of the Judgment Day, the first thing I want you to imagine, the great crowd. Every soul in which was created will be there. And they will all be present for the same reason. As you think about this great crowd, we think about Romans chapter 14, verses 9 through 12. And we find in that section, as the section ends, all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That means everyone that's been in existence, everyone in which was created by God, all souls in which were created, will stand before the judgment day. A Second Corinthians 5.10, which was read so well for us just a moment ago, teaches us something. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be evil. There's going to be a great crowd there. And even Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 and 15 depict unto us all people, everyone that's ever existed, will be there. So the judgment day number one, a day of greatness, a great crowd. And what we mean by that is everyone that exists, all souls, everything will be there. It will be a great crowd. But when thinking about the day of greatness, we think about the great judge that's going to be there. Aren't you proud to know that when the judgment day comes, you do not have to stand before me? You do not have to stand before the elders of any congregation? You do not have to stand before the entire group or the body in which exists the body of Christ? You do not have to stand before a council? You do not have to stand before a man, a ruler, a lawyer? You're not standing before an emperor? You're not going to stand before an earthly king. You're not going to stand before the President of the United States. You will not stand before Supreme Court justices. You will not stand before man. But we will all stand before the Son of God. That should be, in all reality, a day of greatness. The judgment day should not be something that scares the child of God because we should be people that understand who God is. And when imagining the day of judgment, go with me to Matthew chapter 25, we must understand that we are not going to be standing before mere man. We're going to be able to stand before the God of heaven. We're going to be able to stand before the Son of God. We're going to be able to stand before the one in which depicts as speaking truth. 
In, in Matthew 25, we're going to find this in verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all His holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. Now, the same thing is found in John chapter 5, verse 22. The Son of Man is going to be the one in which we sit before. So all people of the earth, all people in which have been created, will be before the Son of God. He will be there. He is considered the great judge. He is considered the truth speaker. He is considered the one who is fair, just, and righteous. And we don't have to stand before each other. So the day of greatness comes with the crowd, the judge, and it also comes with a great parting. You know, you may be thinking, just as I am, just to a degree, that this great parting may be to a degree sad. And that may be the case. Because we understand something that's very simple, and we do not have to look at biblical passages for this. Our world is filled with good people, and our world is filled with those we would consider bad. That's a very simple illustration. We understand that there are people who go after evil, and we understand that there are people who go after that which is good. The judgment day will be no particular depiction. Uh, Paul penned in the current concerning the great separation also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through, or 7 through 9. But I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 25 and notice with me what happens after verse 31 all the way down to verse 34. We find here in verse 32 of Matthew 25, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a, sheep divideth his sheep, or as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. There will be at the day of judgment a great separation. And it will be a separation of people. It will be a separation of people as described in this particular section, sheep and goats. I hope you will spend some time at some point in the future looking through the New Testament and notice how many times the people of God are referred to as sheep. And notice so many times even before the establishment of the church as people are described as a people having no shepherd. Imagine the parables in which Jesus taught when he taught the parable of going after the one where he left the 99. And imagine the wonderful depiction that's found here. He's concerned about his sheep. At this great day, the saint and the lost will be separated. Which one are you? Which one are you? When we think about the day of judgment, I want you to think about a day of brightness. A day of brightness. It's going to be a great day. It's going to be a great day, but it's going to be a bright day. Here's where we have to ask a question, and we've got to get into a little math here. How bright is the sun? How bright is the sun? Well, people have calculated this out, and they've determined that the sun is equal to a large number. I'm not going to try to say this number. I'm not even really going to try to count the zeros in this number. Uh, but if I get this correctly, the sun is 3.846 times 10 to the 26th power. That's a large number. So let's put it into something in which we understand. We understand in far as concerning what we can see in this universe, what we can literally lay our eyes upon. The brightest thing we understand is the sun. So when we start talking about a bright day, we have to imagine the sun for just a moment. Uh, in our terms, we think of light bulbs, don't we? A 100-watt light bulb. That's something we can all understand. If we took this number, in which is found here, and we divided it out, we would need four quadrillion 100-watt light bulbs to equal the sun. Now, that's the brightest thing we can see. But I want you to imagine the bright day that's being described. And you can probably, in your mind, just as we're thinking I am, I can hear verse 2. There's a bright day coming. A bright day coming. The brightest thing we understand is the sun. And we can extrapolate that down to four quadrillion 100 watt light bulbs. It's bright. The day of judgment is going to outshine everything in which exists in judgment. Or everything in which that exists in the existence of God. 
When God created light by speaking it into existence, he said that it was good and it was a great thing. The day of judgment is described to the child of God as a day being brighter than the sun. I hope every time you see the sun rising in the morning, you think of the judgment day. Because there is going to be a day in which is brighter than anything in which we can conceive. Not that it's going to ruin our eyesight or ruin our vision. Not that it's going to be a brightness that's going to be unbearable like the sun could be. But it's going to be a day of brightness as considered as pure. And here's what we find. There's going to be a bright people there. A bright people. Go with me back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. You know, God's people have always been given the greatest challenge. As we look in the Old Testament, they were depicted to be people in which were different. They were separate. They were set apart. As we look in the New Testament, we're going to find the depiction of people supposing to be the greatest people that exist upon the earth. And we see in Matthew chapter 5 a wonderful depiction talking about light in verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth out light unto all that are in the house. Let so your light, or let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. On the day of judgment, there's going to be a group of people in which are going to shine brighter than the others. Not because God created them better. Not because God chose them to be the brightest people of the world. Not because they're going to be defined by brightness standards of 100 watt light bulbs. Not because we're going to be able to look at them and say, that's a bright person. We use that phrase, don't we? He's very bright. A bright people on the day of judgment are people that follow after God. There are people that are faithful unto God. And I love the depiction found in Matthew 5, 14 through 16. They are people that do not try to hide their light. You know, Christianity needs one thing. It needs people to shine their light forth in this world. We would call this world many times a world of darkness. And we see the light in which is found in the judgment day. We see the same thing being found in Matthew 25, 34 through 30. It shows how we can use and obtain this light. And it shows us how bright people receive a reward. So in a day of brightness, number one, we know it's going to be a bright day. Four quadrillion 100 watt light bulbs equal the brightness in which we imagine. And we know it's going to be brighter than that. We imagine the people in which are going to be on this day, and these are people that are faithful unto God. There are people that have let their light shine in the world in which God has created, but there are people that which will receive a bright reward. Now, that's why I constantly say the people of God do not have anything to worry about in the judgment day. Go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. We're going to spend a lot of time in Matthew chapter 25 because we see over and over in this chapter things in which God has depicted in the kingdom of heaven. We look at verse 14, we emphasize these things. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And he gave unto one five talents, another two, and another one. We're seeing a depiction here of these people. And we understand in the world there are different people and all have different abilities. And it's what we do with our lives that's important. It's what we do with what's given that's important we see a depiction of these individuals found in the bright reward, and we notice what's given unto the faithful. Uh, we look at verse 20, and he that had received five talents came and brought five others. So now he has ten, saying, Lord, thou deliverest me five talents. Behold, I have gains beside them five more. Notice tw verse 21 very carefully. His Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. The scene starts changing again. He also that received two talents said unto his Lord, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, and I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. We're seeing a depiction here of those who are faithful. Now, we're not saying that we're going to enter the judgment day and we're going to say, Lord, here are the things I'm bringing to you. We're not going to bring physical things of this earth to the judgment day. It's not the way it was designed. It's not the way it's going to be. But there is something we're going to bring 
to the judgment day. There's something that's going to be required of all men on the judgment day. And just as these individuals who were given these talents, these monies, had to bring back unto their master, we are going to stand before our master. And it's going to be what we've brought to him. We're going to bring our soul in which he has given unto us. But not only that, we're going to bring unto him that which we've done with our soul. You know, we need to remember that as we go throughout life, it's not just this physical body that exists. God gave us a soul. That's why I like to talk about the number of people in the world, the eight or nine trillion people that exist on this earth. They're not just people. They're souls. And we have to remember that as we walk upon this earth, we're not just a person. We're not just a number on a page. We're not just a social security number. We're a soul. You and I possess a soul. And God gave us our souls. And it was perfect and it was pure and it was just as it was designed. But we all understand that sin exists. And we get caught up in that sometimes. And we've got to present our souls somehow in the midst of all of these things that are happening. Notice in this particular occasion in Matthew chapter 25, God gives great things, or this master gave great things unto those in which were faithful to him. The man in which was given one talent, he hid his talent, he was afraid. Uh, verse 24, then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I, I knew that thou art a hard man reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest, that I reap, thou knowest that I reap where I sowed not, that I gather where I have sowed, or that I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury, with interest. You know, our world many times is like this one talent man. They were given a soul. They were given one of the most precious things that exist. And they were afraid. You know, usually when we see sin in the midst of a people, we're going to read this phrase, especially when looking at the Old Testament. And they were afraid. And fear came upon the people. You know, fear causes us to do so many things. And it seems here that this man, because of his fear, it caused him to lose that which he had to gain. And in this particular section in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus in verse 14 teaches us, we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. We're talking about that which is going to come after the judgment day. And we're talking about the scenes of the judgment day. Here these two faithful individuals brought those ten and four talents unto their master. And their master was right and just with them. Here the one man who was given one talent or one scope of money came back unto his master and he said, Master, you're not fair. You do not do things right and I was afraid of you. And the master plainly told him, You know I'm not those things. You were wicked. You were evil. And therein lies the problem. It's a day of brightness because there's a bright reward. But there's a contrast to that bright reward. There is a sad reward. And that brings us to our third thing. You know, we don't like to talk about sadness. I'm pretty sure if I ask you to raise your hand if you wanted to talk about sad things this morning, that no one would raise their hand. We don't like to talk about things that are depressing. We don't like to talk about things that make us hurt. We don't like to think about things in which bring pain, sorrow, and suffering in our world. But the judgment day, in reality, is a day of sadness. You know, for the faithful Christian, it's not a day of sadness. But for those in which exist in this world, it will be a sad day. You know, there are so many passages in which teach us that sad days exist. When we think back to the Old Testament, we can think of several of these days. Uh, there was a sad day for Adam and Eve, in which they were evicted from the place in which God placed them. There was a sad day for Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities in which were destroyed for their wickedness. There was a sad day when the people of God created a golden calf and began to worship it. And, and there was a sad day for Aaron when he said, I just put the gold in the fire and it came out. There was a sad day when David lusted after that which was not his. There was a sad day when a man named Judas was greedful of money. 
It was a sad day when a couple called Ananias and Sapphira made it look like they had done so much more than they actually had done. There was a sad day about a man named Demas in which it's described, he forsook the Lord. There are sad days depicted in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. And in the judgment day for those that are not faithful unto God, there is a sad day being depicted. You know, John 5, 28 through 30, and even in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, there is a sad day being depicted. You look at verse 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited not me. There will be a sad day on the judgment day. But the sadness is not for those that are faithful unto God. It's for those that are unfaithful to Him. That means there's going to be a sad people. A sad people. Hear what these three verses mean in Matthew 8, Matthew 13, and Luke 16. In Matthew 8, 10 through 12, there are people depicted in the New Testament as having no faith. People that have no faith will meet a sad day. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 42, people are depicted as being safe in the arms of the Lord or being safe as his child. But the opposite sign found in Matthew 13, 42 is there are people that will have no safety. In Luke chapter 16, verses 23 through 25, we find the depiction of people in which can have help. But we're going to find it's going to be a sad day for those that do not have help. And the help in which we find is a Savior. Which brings us into our third and final point. There's going to be a sad reward. You know, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 says that the fires in hell are everlasting. They're eternal. They're ageless. They're timeless. And they always will be. We read in Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 that those that are lost on the judgment day will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And the ending of that verse reads this, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I I like to read the words forever and ever as a child of God. Because you and I both understand forever and ever for the child of God are days and endless numerable hours of happiness, joy, and pleasure in the midst and the sight of the Lord. But we understand for those that are not faithful, forever and ever is night and day, day and night, in torment. We often contemplate what is the worst thing about hell. And we don't even really like to say the word hell because it it really should scare us. It really should shake us to the core. It really should make us concerned for our world. But we have to understand a few things. Number one, there is a reality, and that is called hell. Number two, the place in which it's called hell is eternal. But number three, the worst thing, the most terrible thing, the scariest part, The most saddening depiction is, on this day, for eternity, those in which are not faithful unto God will be separated from Him for eternity. We live in a world in which we're able to make decisions. We're able to correct our wrongs. We're able to right our friendships. We're able to make our wrongs right. But there's coming a day in which that will be over. I do not know when this day is. You do not know when this day is. Nobody upon this earth knows when this day is. Men have tried to guess, and they've come up short every time. There's a great day coming. When we talk about the judgment day, I want to leave us with this one encouraging fact. The great day that's coming begins now. The great day that's coming begins now. And here's what I mean. If you are a child of God, if you have been immersed in water because of your faith, because of your repentance, because of your confessing, because of your turning away from sin, if you've been immersed in water in the watery grave of baptism, you are a child of God. But it's up to you, and it's up to me 
to stay as a child of God. You know, it may be the case this morning that one of us as children of God have walked away from the Lord in some way. We've went against His principles, His commandments in some way. We've done something that will leave us in an eternal, separated state from Him in some way. Here's why this is the greatest day right now. And this is why the judgment day begins now. We are privileged with the opportunity right now as children of God to make our wrongs right and to make our sins forgotten and to leave this building this morning with a pure heart, a pure conscience, and a saved life. Here's no reason number two, this is the greatest beginning to the judgment day. It may be the case this morning that you're not a child of God. And I would be imagining in my mind that there may be someone here this morning that's not. The greatest blessing exists today because you can leave here a child of God. You do not have to leave here on your own. You do not have to leave here in sin. You can leave here a child of God. If you're willing to, in humility, demonstrate your faith, believe in Him, repent of your past sins, which means change, confess His sweet name, be immersed in water, and go on about your life as a child of God. You can make this the beginning to a great day. If you need to become a child of God or need to make your life right with Him, why don't you come as together we stand and sing. When peace like a river attends.